exchange for Catholicism in, in places from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and National Catholic Reporter. He's He's been in media in, in Italy, France, Germany, Brazil, even the Pope's home country of Argentina and many other countries. And now he's here to elucidate all of that for us. So Montimo, we're very, very pleased to welcome you. And Jim Smith, our associate director and uh, an alum of uh, the University of yep. St. Thomas. Uh, Jim will, as always, deftly facilitate our discussion. So Massimo, welcome to Dignity USA, and thank you for bringing your perspective on Pope Francis and all things Catholic to this conversation. Thank you. My, my pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Massimo. And uh, I'm particularly proud to um, to have you on our Queer Catholic Faith webinar because of the fact that you are now currently on, on campus where I spent uh, four good years and then um, eight years beyond that on the seminary campus and then back on the main campus um, and have great memories of, of my time there. So I'm, I'm glad to see they've got some good theologians and historians uh, working, working the place. And you are, as I just mentioned, not just a theologian, but also a church historian. And you dabble deeply in uh, many aspects of church. You're not a sexual ethics theologian, so we're not gonna get in depth on, on uh, those particular issues. But I, I do want to scratch your brain uh, a bit uh, with a couple of questions uh, on um, sort of the, the, the environment these days for theologians. Um, it seems to me that in the past 30 or so years, 20, 25 years, um, we've lived under sort of a pray, pay, and obey um, dictum um, in the church. And I'm wondering if there really is, under Pope Francis, sort of a greater freedom uh, among theologians to, to reflect with integrity and honesty uh, on all things church and morals and faith. Is, does, does the environment feel safer to you and to your, to your colleagues in the work or not? Well. Uh, it feels absolutely safer, so there's no question about that. Uh, but first of all, uh, the environment has always been a bit safer in the United States than in other countries hmm. for, for many reasons. I mean, that might I mean, sound shocking because of what we have heard of the investigations uh, against right. the U.S. Right. Right. But the very large and strong network of Catholic colleges and universities in the U.S. has always provided theologians with uh, a protection in this country that they don't enjoy in other countries. So that is the first thing. Hmm. The second thing is, it is uh, so there's no question that Pope Francis has created a, a, a new climate because of his style, because of what he has said on many controversial issues. He has said many times that uh, the debate is, is healthy, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So he's not afraid of that. Uh, an interesting thing is that he chose, uh, he, he's choosing not to, uh, to play the Pope's role in a theological debate. So that was typical of Pope Benedict. What is the Pope's role? What do you mean by that? Well, the, with Pope Benedict, it became absolutely normal that the Pope as a theologian would, would speak as a theologian in a humble way, rhetorically speaking, but everybody knew that he was the Pope, so his theological voice was not just one of the many voices. And because he had been the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the former Holy Office, mm -hmm. the fact that we had a Pope with such a prominent uh, 
resume as a theologian, as an academic theologian, that complicated very much the style of debate in the church. Right, right. So Last thing with Pope Francis, so uh, the way he's governing the church from Rome, one of the most interesting things is that he's basically governing without the Roman Curia. So he is bypassing them mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. and specifically, specifically uh, he has reduced radically the, uh, the role and the visibility of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. Mm -hmm. It was under John Paul II especially the the policy maker of uh, the Catholic Church. So when Joseph Ratzinger was prefect, and under John Paul II, the Holy Office was the uh, those few rooms. They right. were setting the tone for everybody. That's no longer true. Okay. So that change. Uh, so there is a change in terms of of style of debate and there are also institutional changes that are typical of what Pope Francis is doing. Yeah. Before, before I um, tag a, a, another question on to, to your answer there, I want to remind our attendees that you are um, more than welcome to be asking uh, Massimo questions in the second half of our show and I already see one really good question that Stephen from New York has asked. Um, thanks for that, Stephen. By all means, folks, um, go ahead and, and type your questions when they come to you, and we will then begin addressing them um, in the second half of the show. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't um, type those questions uh, when you think of them at any point um, from here on out. So, Stephen, thanks for that first question, and we'll come back to that in the second half of the hour. And Massimo, your audio is good so thank you for that uh, uh, Massimo comes from a day of chasing his two uh, young children around and he's a little exhausted and so we're very grateful that he's taken some time out in, in a busy evening to be with us so um, do you think that this Pope uh, is also going to be paying close attention to folks like yourself um, in you know in 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 his own discernment um is there evidence of that yet well that's a, a very good question so so far pope francis uh has interacted very little very few times with the world of professional theology mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't like to present himself as an academic theologian. Right. That is interesting, and that is, in a way, atypical of a pope. Uh, so, especially Pope Benedict, but also John Paul II, they like to see themselves as intellectuals. So, Pope Francis' skills are, and he's he, his persona is not academic, uh, and by the way, I mean we should remember that he's a pope who doesn't have a PhD, which is, I think, it's a good. good thing. Which, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it, uh, uh, the world of academia can isolate you from reality. That, that's very very easy. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, also for academic theology um, yeah. and for research. I mean, yeah. So I think so. What's interesting about him is that uh, he has big antennas, big ears. So he's not paying attention to the to the minutia, to one particular issue in a debate on this or that. But what we have seen so far is that. He's very uh, aware of the big trends, of the big movements 
in the church. So how the, the church thinks, the church feels. And, and so he has chosen a few names. So one is Walter Casper. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other names that we know he read. He okay. Reading, but, but they're not so uh, public. Okay. But this work is not about interfering with academic theology, and which Good. is, I think, very wise, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you think that the uh, the environment also is more akin, is is warm to um, the the revelations of the spirit as the spirit speaks through through human experience? And I, I want to give one example only, and that is uh, our transgender kin who um, and their families. Um, and those of us who are close allies are very frustrated these days with with what um, prelates are are spewing about, are saying about transgender identity. And it's clear that they're not listening to modern uh, brain science exploration, to psychology, nor are they listening at all to the experience of these families and these individuals. Um, and the Pope seems to be honoring uh, the fact that in, that in fact there is uh, a sense of the faithful, that, that the Spirit does speak in the experience of God's people. Uh, do you think, do you, do you see that confirmed in his leadership and do you, are you hopeful? And what, what's your personal opinion about the, the role of human experience plays in theological reflection? So, um, he is, uh, he, Pope Francis, is a Pope whose most important theological imprint is the Second Vatican Council. So, this big event of, of um, that mm -hmm. happened between 62 and 65, and one of the major changes in theology that happened there was the idea that human experience um, is a fundamental source for theology. So it is something that teaches us something. Uh, it's not an accident. It's not something that happens and we shouldn't pay attention. In what he's doing as a pope, it's clear that he has accepted the theological turn, but what's different in him is that uh, he has appropriated Vatican II. So that idea, that experience is fundamental to make, to understand things and to make theological judgment. Mm -hmm. In a particular biographical itinerary, which is very different from anybody else on the chair of Peter in these last few centuries. So what's typical of him is that he was the, superior, uh, the provincial superior of the religious order, where issues of sexual identity are much more visible mm -hmm. than in a diocesan priest, mm -hmm. because their lifestyle is different. So it, it, it's a lifestyle in community where you notice more things. You, you share your experience with others instead of living in one parish isolated from, from mm -hmm. the others. And second, his experience was uh, the, the experience of a street priest, of a street pastor, who um, has met, has worked, talked to a number of very different people. And so for example, uh, we know that what he's saying on Humane Vitae, on on contraception, uh, so Massimo, I can't hear you all of a sudden. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Attendees, can you still hear Massimo? I just lost him.
So apparently we can't hear you, Massimo. Um, I'm wondering. Um, Would you unplug your unplug your earplugs from the computer and plug it back in again? And Logan, I'm um, ask you what what we can ask Massimo. Uh, what else he can do if this doesn't work? Hold on, we'll get this. Is your connection still pretty strong? Do, 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 do the bars still show up strong, Massimo, on your computer? Okay. <laughs> Some say it, as long as long as we can see you, you're kind of cute. It's it, things are okay, but we, we really do want to hear you as well. Um, and Logan, this is from Massimo to check the sound on your system preferences. Do you know where to find your system preferences on your Mac? The other thing we can try, Massimo, is if you just um, if you just use your computer speakers and take the uh, take the headphones off and unplug them. Try that, and then we've got another option bef uh, if that doesn't work. Okay, so. Ask you to um, close the browser. Don't don't click on end meeting. Just close your browser, and then you'll be able you'll be invited to re-enter the meeting. Okay, if you click on the link again. So close your browser and come back in. All right, folks. I want to mention that Massimo has done a huge amount of, of exploration and research into uh, not only the documents of Vatican II, but, but the entire proceedings before, during, and after. He is, he is, he may be young, but he's uh, an unbelievable expert on Vatican II, and I've got some questions for him on that. But um, again, just to just to tickle your brains, if you have questions around Vatican II that you might want to ask him, he's the guy to guy to ask. Um, he has spent hundreds and hundreds of hours, literally, in exploration in Vatican archives, um, uh, and uh, so he's 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 a good one to ask questions when it when it comes to Vatican II. So let's hope he can rectify his sound issues so we can understand him. And again, um, he's also uh, uh, very interested in church movements, not necessarily ours, uh, you know, the, the movement around LGBT rights. Is that you, Massimo? I'm here. Oh, great. We can hear you. Okay, so no earplugs. Okay, yep, we'll just go without the earplugs. And if this happens sure. again, you may need to just log out and log back in again. So thanks for okay. thanks for doing that. Um, I, I want to ask you about Vatican II. I was just uh, forewarning our our audience that you have done tons and tons of research on Vatican II documents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I'm hearing my echo. So let's, are you, are you all hearing my echo? Oh, better. Okay, so I'll keep talking. Um, you've done tons of research, not just on the documents of Vatican II, but on the event itself, on the process. Um, can you say a little bit about the, the difference or the, 
the, the significance not only of the the uh, the documents that we have before us, but the actual event and its influence. Well, Vatican II is important for the for the Church still today after 50 years because it is a great example of how to solve uh, issues in the church that need an extraordinary moment of discernment. So the typical way of solving problems in the church is it is really monarchical, uh, but when we are uh, facing new issues, like the issues in the 60s, of science of uh democracy i mean back then for the for the church the pope i mean pope john the 23rd decided that it was not enough a top down kind of decision uh, but it was time to for a collegial i mean process mm -hmm. uh, that is important for us because i think it's similar to the situation we are right now for issues like human sexuality, uh, which are new issues. Mm -hmm. And for those kind of issues, there's no hope that one single person top down will be able to solve uh, intellectually, spiritually, uh, or, or, uh, that issue. And that is why for France it's called the Synod on the Family in two steps. I mean, October 2014, October 2015, um, because uh, he understood that when there are very important and new issues, you need a collegial debate. A collegial part. So here, Vatican II is important for some issues for those documents, mm -hmm. but in general, it, it's important because it showed us uh, a method to make decisions mm -hmm. and to discern new issues in a collegial way, which is in very important moments the best way to do things. So that's why Vatican II okay. is very important. Okay. And what elements of the Vatican II events or the teachings that have come out of Vatican II do you believe will continue to be played out with some force? And, and make a significant difference in the years to come. So, as you know, Vatican II published many documents, 16 documents. Uh, right. So, many of them are still very solid. Some of them are very old right now. And some of them are still the future of the Church. So, for, for example, the most important document to understand Pope Francis is the document on the Church in the modern world. Gaudium et Spes. That is the Spes. crucial document to understand. Why? Why that document? Because it's the document that says basically that the church and the world, they coexist. And the church has to learn from the world uh, something. Uh, that is, so Gaudium et Spes is the crucial document and that's very visible in the most important document of Pope Francis, the exhortation Evangelii Gaudium mm -hmm. of November 2013, mm -hmm. uh, has many, many quotations from Gaudium et Spes. Okay. Uh, so if I had to pick one document to make sense of what, of what Pope Francis is doing, is certainly Gaudium et Spes. And by the way, Next week, we will have a big conference on campus at St. Thomas on Gaudium et Spes. A big gathering because it, it, it's crucial to understand what's happening right now. That is that open to the public? Uh, the four keynote sessions, yes. Okay. Um, yes. On I don't Thursday, know if we have any attendees from Minnesota, but, anyway, but yeah. good to know. Uh, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change paragraphs here quickly. Um, because I've got several questions to go, and we're running out of time here already. Looking to the next synod, the second synod of the bishops on the family, what are you anticipating? And and I, I and it, not just exclusively, but especially regarding those hot button issues. 
um, of the that were surfaced in the last synod. So I have, I don't know what they're going to decide. I know that it's going to be a real debate, as it has been last October. So not a show, but a real debate with different positions, different documents, mm -hmm. and alternative views. Um, so in this, there are different options. I mean, different. I mean, scenarios. One could be that the Pope, in the end, makes his decisions to change something in the practice of the Church about uh, divorced, remarried. Uh, it might happen that he would call uh, another gathering after because he understands that we are making progress, but we need to to continue. So it's not not easy to say what will be. What is very clear is that he has resuscitated the practice of synodal discussions in the church. That in the previous 40 years, more or less, I mean, since the 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 death of Paul the Sixth, all the synods they were just showed. Show. Uh, mm -hmm. That is a real difference, and mm -hmm. that might. Uh, trigger other changes in a number of other issues. Mm -hmm. That's hopeful to hear. Thank you. Now, what about the world meeting of families which precedes the Second Synod? Do you have any thoughts as to the effect of that gathering on the Synod discussions or on the future of the Church? Uh, that is even more complicated. Mm -hmm. you no. Know, why? Because the visit of Pope Francis to America will be the most complicated visit, the most dangerous. I mean, not for the uh, the person of the of, of the Pope, but uh, the visit where there are more unknowns. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you know, this uh, this World Congress of the Families will be in in uh, Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, whose bishop is one of the bishops who has shown to be, let's say, not very impressed with, with uh, Pope Francis. So we don't know, <laughs> we don't know uh, how the Pope's presence will be set up mm -hmm. there. Okay. We don't know. It, 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 to be very interesting to know what is going to be the Pope's role in that and how that that Congress in Philadelphia is organized in this the committee that is going to is preparing that has a very important role. Yeah. Because uh, because as I say in my book, I mean Pope Francis is uh is going to to Present American Catholics with they with many challenges. The France is the the Pope who in in this in these last few decades or century in this last century he's the least familiar with American culture. Uh, in this sense, that visit of next next September will be the most important. Was it days. was it true that John Paul II and especially uh, Benedict were sort of enamored by by the American experience, political, economic, otherwise? Sure, there's no question about that. So John Paul II, because of of anti-communism, that was, okay, was, that was one of the most important reason, and Pope Benedict, because the neoconservative uh, stream in American Catholicism uh, uh, was one of the most important pillars. Uh, interesting. Not for Ratzinger himself, so not for him himself, but for the Ratzinger following. Yeah. 
So the neoconservative idea is integral part of, uh, the, of the Ratzinger cult. Yeah. That, and for that, he, Rosa Ratzinger, was not entirely responsible for that. But um, that, so in, in this last, these last 35 years uh, have been quite easy for American Catholics of, of a certain kind because they found a very welcoming audience mm -hmm. in Rome. Yeah, yeah. With Pope Francis, that is different. And yeah. we have seen something in his decisions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Before we get to questions, and there are a few here, I, I, I want to um, highlight the fact that you are You've been an outsider, and you're coming in from a from a from an Italian European cultural experience and standpoint. You are seeing our American church, the church in America, from uh, sort of from the outside looking in. And I want to hear what you see. Um, how does how does the American church differ from the church that you grew up in and know in Italy in Europe? What are the differences? Well, it is good, bad, and ugly. ugly. Sorry? Good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's been my salvation, I mean, professionally, so I, I cannot... It is very different in the sense that uh, it is, I mean, sociologically and, and intellectually much more active. There's no question about that. So that's the U.S.? Not, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Much more active, much more militant. I mean, what do you mean by militant? Well, it strongly believes in what it does. It, okay. It, it, it uh, strongly. That is the good thing. The bad thing is that it's a deeply divided church. Mm -hmm. Okay. They say in uh, in in one of my articles that was published last year in American magazine seems to me sometimes that the the fact of having uh, a, a two-party political system in this country has created a two-party Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. That is unique. That is something that you don't find anywhere else. I mean, I've studied in Germany, in Canada. I I have taught and lectures I mean, in many countries. You don't have this Two party church. You have more than two parties in, in these other well, countries, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So here I mean And it's a consent the, consensual environment with regard yeah, to politics. Consensual well here is very competitive also culturally. Okay. So if you are a Vatican to Catholic, you are labeled as a liberal. If you are a Pope Benedict Catholic, you are labeled as conservative, um, and there are these identities that uh, don't talk too much to each other. Mm -hmm. That is the, the biggest problem, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. so, but there are many differences. Yeah. How do you see that? Do you see that healing? Um, and if so, how? Well, I can, I can relate uh, directly my experience with young students, and I have seen a distinct Francis affect among young Catholics, uh, even conservative Catholics, uh, or just, or t uh, traditional young Catholics. Yeah, they they see in Pope Francis something that they haven't seen before. So that might be so. Here, what's good about Pope Francis is that it's very difficult to frame him ideologically. Yeah, he's not a liberal. But is not that, that yeah. could be the greatest thing mm. of this country, okay. because uh, yeah, that's that's I I have seen something that uh, gives me hope actually. So mm -hmm. yeah, I am hearing that 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 that's definitely a thread in in your words tonight. Um, yeah. There, there, there is great hope. I'm going to turn now to the questions that folks that folks have. Let me bring those up here. Okay. 
Thanks, Logan and others, for compiling these. So I'm um, Stephen Fratello from New York asks, can you clarify the statement Francis made recently about the trans trans identity? Now I'm not so sure he was talking about transgender identity. He did use the term gender I, I, gender identity, uh, but he compared it to nuclear weapons. <laughs> Does Francis contradict himself often, or is he just misunderstood? Um, and Stephen says I find him confusing, and I think a lot of people do. Yeah. So here. Uh, uh, Francis is not a systematic thinker. <laughs> is not so, uh, and there's this tendency. I have to say, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, to 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 take one sentence and interpret the one sentence without the context. So that mm. is so that is one problem. The other problem is this: is that Pope Francis uses a lot of metaphors, of images, of uh, reading like rabbits, you mean? Allegory. <laughs> so, uh, all that said, all that said, and there's also one problem of, with translation sometimes. And, uh, it, it is very difficult to 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 read uh, for Francis. I have, I wrote when an article last month about that. But all that said, it is. So that Pope Francis is not comfortable with the culture of the sexual identity and so on. Mm. So he's very comfortable in talking about the pastoral approach to gays, lesbians. Uh, intellectually, it's not his uh, best mm -hmm. uh, suit. Let, let, let's say that. Mm -hmm. So in this, um, and he has the same issue, I would say, when he speaks about women. Yeah, the same indeed, thing. absolutely. So that is partly generational, it is partly cultural, so uh, in cultures other than the North American culture, uh, these issues are still today not taught in schools, yeah. not even in seminaries. In, yeah. in, in all those schools. So here there is a 50% of, I mean, a language issue, a, a literary kind of, I mean, uh, way of speaking. Yeah. But there's also a real issue with uh, how much he can explain of what he knows in a, a language that we are comfortable with. Yeah. So that is a real issue. Um, yeah. My recommendation would be to try and look at all the time, every time, at the whole picture of what he's saying. Yeah. The context. So that is, yeah. Uh, it's a good, it's a good, uh, good insight, good advice. So. But I, I I would say that I find Pope Francis sometimes I mean shocking, but I I wouldn't say he's contradictory. Mm. I wouldn't say I mean um, so I don't always agree with what he says, but uh, I don't think he's prone to contradict himself. Mm -hmm. it is, um, yeah, it may seem that way when we simply. Take the hear the snippets, you know the the one sentence, the one sentence verbiages, yeah. uh, rather than taking yeah. in context. Thank you. Yeah. So That's Jim, Jim has a question. Jim Gone, who is a faithful attendee here at uh, QCF, I'm interested to know if you think Pope Francis will overturn or end the directives hostile to the American LCWR, or how do you think? He will alter that, if at all. Well, he has basically done that already. So uh, the investigation, uh, so one of the two investigations that was I mean, organized in the Vatican in the early 2000s, uh, 
against the US nuns was concluded in November uh, and it, there was this big press conference in the Vatican with many nuns there uh, sitting at the table and speaking mm -hmm. with the Vatican people and it, and the Vatican basically apologized. Mm -hmm. So they didn't use that word, <laughs> but they basically apologized. So, uh, as you know, the Catholic Church is not very good at saying sorry. So don't expect that. <laughs> but they came very close to do that. Mm -hmm. So here Pope Francis has no appetite for this kind of uh, witch hunt. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you on this. N the next question: What do you think that the global focus on Francis means for those of us who are committed to the Church as the people of God? Um, and he, and the question: is, It seems there is a re-centralization of power happening, and I'm I'm wondering if the person means decentralization of power. Um, but if I understand the question correct, um, do you think Francis is is akin to that image uh, of church as the people of God? Oh, we can't hear you again, Massimo. So, um, can't hear you. So, I think you need to log out and uh, log back in again, as you did before. That was the last question I had in my notes. I think we still have a couple minutes for another question, though I did see one. Did I see one before? Yes. Okay. Question related to religious liberty. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I think Pope Francis is a Pope of the people of God. I mean, people of God, the theology of the people are key expressions for him. Um, so I think he, in this sense, he's the most I mean, Vatican II Pope we had in these last 50 years. Uh, if, I if I understand correctly that question a a about centralization, that is a real danger. So, this Pope is so attractive, is so popular, that we mm -hmm. may be tempted to hope that every I mean, possible solution to our problems is yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is a real problem. So yes. here, there's a problem of expectations. Mm -hmm. So this Pope is not Superman. I mean, mm -hmm. he in flight, Amen. he does incredible things with his press conferences in flight, but he's not Superman. So that is one problem. What he's doing, I think, is to is to try and got some reactions from the Church. So the Synod of Bishops, this. So he's trying to resuscitate a certain collegial practice that was dead, basically. So here there is a danger of centralization. What he has done, as he has said, is in, 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 in a view of a decentralization that he sees that is necessary. So in, in Evangelii Gaudium he says, we should give back uh, to the national conferences uh, authority because they had lost it and so on. So um, I am hopeful because he's aware that uh, centralization is not the solution. Um, but the media system, our expectations and so on, might lead us to hyper-centralize. That's true. We have another question here, <clears throat> um, and it's uh, for those of you uh, uh, attending who may not have heard 
Marianne's introduction, um, Massimo is, is at the University of St. Thomas also um, heading up a new institute called the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship. Um, can you say briefly, Massimo, what the purpose of that institute is? And you said sure. a little bit before the interview about um, what what the the inception of that institute means about the the environment at St. Thomas these days, and perhaps other Catholic colleges. Well, the attempt of this institute is to bring uh, different voices uh, on campus um, and to have them talk to each other about theological uh, ideas that are important for our life in a political community and in in a social community and so for example in these last few years we have uh seen this debate on religious liberty that was driven mostly by cultural uh, ideological reasons and there was no real I think good theological debate on what religious freedom is, uh, what it really is, what is the history of the idea of religious freedom in the Catholic Church, which I mean comes from from Vatican two fifty years ago. So our is an attempt to restore um, a certain intellectual I mean preeminence when we talk about social issues, political issues, that we might think we can solve, I mean, taking a shortcut in saying, well, we have always done that, so why change? Or, so, I mean, we think that... Um, that it's you give a real example to, to illustrate. Well, for example, if you read the document of 2012 of the U.S. bishops on religious liberty, Mm-hmm. What the, the document says is basically we are in favor of religious freedom because we've always been in favor of religious freedom. But that's not true. Man, that's false. It's a false statement historically. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church always had a huge, huge problem with the idea of religious freedom. In the U.S. specifically, that was a big problem until 65, because this country was founded on the idea of freedom, while the Catholic Church was against that. Mm -hmm. So here, I mean, to publish such an important statement that dealt with Obamacare, with the White House, and so on, uh, with, on the basis of a false, I mean, basis, I think it was not a good show, let's say that. So we want to restore some I mean, theological uh, voice when we talk about uh, social inequality, when we talk about immigration. When so we need that we think that mm-hmm. uh, theology has something important to say. Mm-hmm. So that is the the reason for this interview. Mm-hmm. And it speaks to the leadership at the University of St. Thomas in what way? Well, it reflects what? As a theology department, we had this idea. I made this proposal. And the university, the new president, Dr. Sullivan, she embraced it. She supported it. Uh, So we found... um, uh, a lot of support from the yeah. uh, the president, the the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. So they understood that we, as as a university, we have a role to play. Also, because in the Church of Pope Francis, theologians are are called to do things. <laughs> so they understood that that as a Catholic university, we have a certain responsibility. Mm-hmm. And it's not just about teaching, but it, it is teaching inspired by research. I mean, teaching inspired by I mean, exchanges and intellectual activity. Mm-hmm. And the research center is is part of of that. So that was very reassuring. That the university 
uh, stood behind this idea and supported it completely. Wonderful. I want to um, I want to draw people's attention to two upcoming publications, two books that Massimo has written and are about to be published this late spring in May. Correct? Yeah, yeah, April and May. So April, April and May. April and the other May. Yes. And the website was just too long to to, to put up here. So just go to Amazon.com and type in Massimo Fagioli and you will come up with these two books on Pope Francis and also um, the Vatican II, the effects of Vatican II in, in, in our time and in our world. Um, also, I want to um, bring your attention to the fact that Massimo is on Twitter and Facebook, and this is wrong. So you see uh, his Twitter account is, has an I at the very end, but not an O. So it's Massimo Fagioli, not Fagiolo. Yeah, um, and and the Facebook, I'm going to type in the Facebook um, address. That's Facebook. Excuse me. Logan, you might be much quicker with this. Facebook.com slash Massimo.Fagioli. Is that correct? It is, yes. Okay. So follow Massimo on Twitter and and Facebook, and if you're interested to purchase his book, you can purchase them now, right? You can pre-order? Uh, I think you can pre-order them. Yes, yeah. okay. One. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, Marianne, if you want to come on now, we've got some news about upcoming uh, Queer Catholic Faith webinars, and I want to thank you, Massimo, for being with us tonight, and I have been thirsty to meet you and to have a conversation with you and feel privileged to, to have done those. Thanks for the good work that you do in the world of theology and church history. Thank you. It was my, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you, Masno. Uh, I hope that many of us will follow you on Facebook and Twitter and see what you're doing because we clearly only scratched the surface tonight. There's a, uh, you know, maybe we'll take this offline. There was one question I was hoping we would get to where, uh, where one of our former national officers said, what advice would you have for us as a movement in the era of wow. Francis? How, how do we advance LGBT liberation theology, essentially? If you want to take a quick minute to summarize that. Yeah, and thank we'll move you. On. Uh, I think it takes patience and courage and, and, I mean, groundwork that I'm sure you are doing. Um, so here, as, as you know, change in the church is always slow. Mm -hmm. But as a historian, I can say that now change is happening on many things, on, on many levels. So it is time to insist, to persist. That That's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, that's hopeful and encouraging. So I appreciate that. So uh, I, I hope all of you found this as exciting and inspirational as I did and would love to uh, see you again. We have a couple more uh, QCF scheduled um, for April and May. Uh, diversity and inclusivity are value, key values for Dignity USA and we'll be addressing that. Uh, Massimo, maybe if you could mute your mic. Um, sure we could uh, get rid of some of this echo. Thank you. Um, so please join us to look at ways uh, that we can enrich our communities uh, with diversity in April. And on May 19th, um, as many of you have heard, Dignity USA and our equally blessed colleagues are sponsoring a pilgrimage to the World Meeting of Families, which we discussed a little bit tonight. And three of the families that are going to be among the 16 currently signed up to make this pilgrimage will be uh, joining us on May 19th in uh, a QCF that is going to be co-sponsored with the Family Equality Council. So that should be a really interesting audience. Uh, we'll have some of the families who are attending uh, speak about their hopes, uh, their fears, their anxieties, and uh, what is the message that they hope to bring to other pilgrims at World Meeting of Family. So another great event. All right. Okay, uh, Marianne, 
I just want to um, tell our attendees that there is a survey, a very brief survey, that will show up automatically on their screens if they don't close their browser after the meeting ends. So we really encourage you to just fill that quick survey out before you close your browser on, on this. Great, thank you. Yes, that information is very important. It takes less than a minute to do it if if you want to. Uh, we really appreciate that feedback. So uh, thank you, Jim, for another great session. Thank you, Massimo, for lots to think about. And thanks to everyone who, uh, who joined us tonight. Uh, we will be, this session was recorded. We will send you the link shortly and uh, we'll also have it available to others. So please uh, encourage others that you think would uh, find value in this session uh, to be there. And if you want more from Massimo, follow him on Facebook or Twitter or read his books. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.